Welcome all to this uh, live Zoom webinar. Uh, it is um, produced by the QUT, Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies. Tonight's title is Reforms to the Queensland Incorporated Associations Act. Uh, we will uh, shortly uh, commence. Uh, if you are having any difficulties, please email acpns at qt.edu.au. Uh, uh, I would um, like to <clears throat> indicate that this is an interactive uh, conference, so please use the Q&A functions uh, to post any questions and we'll endeavour to answer them uh, at the end of the uh, seminar. And there will also be a poll for feedback at the end of the seminar. Firstly, I'd like to introduce our presenters for tonight in the next slide. Our presenters are myself, Miles McGregor Lowndes, um, Professor Emeritus at uh, the Centre, Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies. Also, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Paul Paxton Hall of Paul Paxton Hall Lawyers. Um, I'm very grateful for Paul taking uh, time out uh, today, particularly at this time uh, when it's very busy for lawyers uh, advising uh, nonprofits and all sorts of things about uh, uh, job seeker and uh, other ATO uh, arrangements, HR, and uh, there are a plethora of other um, uh, legal issues that uh, no doubt nonprofits are uh, grappling with. So, Paul, thank you very much uh, for coming tonight. Uh, now, I just want to warn you that this will be recorded and uh, you will be able to access it in a few days. So, um, it will record uh, your comments as well. So, um, be warned. Uh, so, let's make a formal start with an acknowledgement of the traditional owners. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where QT now stands, pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QT uh, community. So the agenda tonight uh, is to deal with uh, these six basic uh, topics. The reforms to the Associations uh, Incorporations Act and a few to the uh, Collections Act are, um, are substantial. Um, it's been since about 2007 when we had the last substantial reforms uh, to the Act. Uh, the bill itself runs for 80 pages, uh, the explanatory memorandum for, for 27 uh, pages. There are over 100 uh, amendments and uh, new sections added. So it is a substantial um, reform document. So first we'll look at the background uh, to, the, to the reforms, to the bill. Um, and uh, things have overtaken us uh, here. Um, we have a bill, uh, it's before Parliament, um, but I'm not sure that Parliament is going to sit to consider uh, the bill before the election, which is due uh, this year. Uh, and if that occurs uh, before the bill's been considered, um, it may be that the bill will have to be reintroduced into the next session. Uh, but anyway, I don't think it's uh, particularly contentious and hopefully the bill, uh, which does have a lot of uh, good things in it for incorporated associations, will be reintroduced at some time in the future if that is the case. So first thing, we'll have a look at what's going on with the reforms and the philosophy and background behind it, what's happened so far. Uh, then we'll have a look at annual reporting. Uh, finally, Queensland uh, catches up uh, with ACNC coordination. So it means that uh, incorporated associations which are registered with the ACNC as charities uh, will have uh, less annual report filing, uh, both uh, for the Incorporated Associations Act and the Collections Act. The third and probably uh, some of the major reforms uh, in this bill are new duties for management committee members and they also uh, spill over into some senior uh, employees uh, as well. Uh, and they will bring us uh, into line with the uh, corporations uh, law type duties, plus a few extra, I think, and Paul will uh, deal with those. The next one is a bit of a controversial one. Uh, well, it was at least controversial before the parliamentary committee which investigated the bill, and that's public disclosure of remuneration 
of management committee members and uh, senior employees. Um, and we'll have a look at that because that's likely to uh, have some uh, changes for those that do remunerate uh, their committee. Uh, fifthly, we'll have a look at grievance procedures. Internal disputes are uh, unfortunately legendary uh, in incorporated associations. Uh, and this is a, a policy initiative, uh, which I suspect tries to uh, cut uh, internal disputes off at the past before they uh, develop into um, serious all out brawls. Uh, but uh, it will require uh, some attentions to your constitutions uh, if you want to uh, uh, properly integrate them into your disciplinary uh, procedures. And then we'll just pick um, some other provisions uh, that are contained in the bill. As I said, it's a, it's a long bill, over 100 uh, substantive amendments, but we'll try and pick the eyes out of uh, some of the more important uh, amendments uh, that uh, we think uh, you should take um, some notice of. So we're going to um, uh, pass it in turns between uh, the two of us this evening. Uh, and at the end, uh, we will happily, happily take some uh, questions and use the Q&A icon uh, to do those. So I'm going to pass over to Paul now uh, to um, sort of lay the background of, of the bill and uh, what's happening. So over to you, Paul. Thank you, Miles. So the, the bill that we saw tabled in the State Parliament at the end of November last year had uh, some years in its gestation. Uh, we had uh, a number of consultation papers and discussions with the Office of Fair Trading in 2010, again in 2010, 2016, uh, and then last year, which culminated in the bill that Miles described at this table. Um, somewhat, uh, well, somewhat typically, really, the, uh, the time period for, um, uh, for commentary on the bill was uh, very restricted. Uh, the bill having been introduced was referred on to committee. Uh, that committee was to have uh, heard public presentations only some seven days later, but that was in fact delayed a little bit to the end of the first week in January. And uh, Miles and I were passing emails in the early part of January from the beach on, uh, on, on changes that we thought were necessary in our wearing our hats as members of the uh, Queensland Law Society's not profit committee. But anyway, as Miles said, the, the bill uh, has not been passed and uh, its future, given uh, the circumstances, is um, uh, somewhat um, uncertain. Um, following on from the uh, parliamentary committee, uh, the committee reported in the middle of February, on 21 February, uh, and uh, its recommendation was that the bill be passed without any amendment. Uh, and we'll deal with some, uh, some commentary around that a bit later. Importantly, though, um, the committee has made the point that it will be some time before the, the final aspects of, uh, aspect of the bill, namely the, the preparation of the model rules, uh, is finalised. Uh, comments made by department uh, members speaking to the, um, to the public committee um, uh, made the point that uh, it was likely that uh, that process would take uh, quite some time, some months, well over a year, uh, and it's thought that some of the regulations, particularly around uh, grievance procedure, will be a full two years before they're actually introduced. Indeed, the, um, uh, the parliamentary committee made the comment, and I'd like to quote because it gives a bit of a setting, I think, for, for that comment that I've just made, uh, when it was said that there will be a process if the bill passes to reform the association's incorporation regulation, which is the uh, instrument that contains the model rules. There will be full consultation on that along the lines that stakeholders have raised. As we know, the devil is in the detail. You'll note that a lot of the bill is about the power or the ability for a regulation to provide for something. However, the detail will be in the regulations and or the model rules, which is a schedule to the regulation. That will be a full process that I suspect will take most of this year to finish if the bill passes. So uh, uh, we will see what happens 
come the latter part of this year. Mars. Thanks, Paul. The next slide uh, deals with annual reporting. Um, Queensland, uh, when this bill is passed, will join a, quite a number of other states in streamlining uh, annual reporting uh, by incorporated associations and entities registered under the uh, Collections Act, which are charities, uh, in that they will report once and that will be to the ACNC. Uh, I suspect that there will be uh, arrangements between the ACNC and the Office of Fair Trading uh, for the Office of Fair Trading to be able to access uh, those reports and information. Um, so it will streamline it by uh, cutting out the duplication of annual report filings. Uh, and the government indicated that there'd be some uh, 3,800 incorporated associations and 3,200 odd under the Collections Act uh, will be relieved of filing uh, with them, uh, provided that they file with the ACNC. Uh, this will be affected through uh, regulations, uh, which the OFT uh, will basically look after to exempt classes, and that class will probably be uh, charities uh, some uh, lines of charities that are registered uh, with the ACNC. Uh, they hope to have it in place for the 2021 financial reporting period, but given the present circumstances that we find ourselves in, uh, that uh, may be delayed, so uh, watch that space. Um, never fear, the OFT can uh, still request information uh, from incorporated associations uh, if required. Uh, over and above the uh, ACNC uh, filings. Uh, I would expect that they would use their discretion and only do that if there was um, some good reason for um, investigation or, or some further uh, matter was as required. Uh, there's another uh, very uh, timely intervention uh, allowed for the OFT to have a discretion on reporting tier one. As you know, that there are three reporting tiers uh, for incorporated associations which are graduated. Uh, tier one uh, is the uh, lowest uh, tier uh, and they have a, a, a reduced reporting uh, regime to the department. Um, where, uh, you, where an organisation in tier one may receive an unusual lumpy one-off grant or uh, fundraising or you're a koala hospital and during the bushfires some wealthy American saw you on TV and gave you a lazy million dollars. Um, if, that, uh, if that occurs and it's, a, it's a, just a lumpy one-off, uh, then you don't have to, the commissioner can org, uh, exercise, the chief executive can organise, can arrange their discretion not to make you to report, report at the higher level if it is just a one-off special circumstances. And that's to be welcomed because we know how lumpy um, income can be in the sector in certain circumstances. Um, it, will, it is hoped that the reporting levels will sync with the ACNC reporting levels. The issue here is that um, at the moment, the Commonwealth Government uh, has a reform report about the ACNC uh, before it. It's made a response that it's going to think about uh, the ACNC reporting levels, particularly at the lower level. Um, so hopefully uh, by the time both governments uh, get around to legislating in this area, uh, they can sync uh, the reporting. It, I think it would make sense to have uh, one reporting level rather than uh, several between different states and the Commonwealth. So. Uh, unless there's good reason, um, I think that uh, uh, an ACNC reporting level uh, would be beneficial. I mean, the Commissioner, the OFT Chief Executive could still exercise the discretion if required for individual charities for some reason. Um, I'll hand back over to, uh, to Paul now. Okay. So now... Uh... Our next slide deals with um, the new duties which are dealt with in the in the bill. 
the um, in the explanatory memorandum, it said that the the purpose of uh, endeavouring to, if you like, duplicate the duties that uh, exist currently in the Corporations Act for directors is all about internal governance improvement. Um, and the idea is that we have, we have a legislative regime that effectively complements the common law and equitable duties around um, those who are in a fiduciary relationship, that is directors or management committee members. So in some senses, the changes which largely mirror the Corporations Act provisions uh, achieve that, um, but there are some differences and changes that I'll mention shortly. So we've got um, regimes that apply to officers and uh, some provisions that apply specifically to management committee members. Um, of course, the first thing one has to do is uh, look to the definition provisions in the Act to make sure that we're, uh, that we're clear on who we're uh, talking about. Officers are defined in the um, Associations and Corporations Act, the AIA, as the President, the Secretary, the Treasurer, a member of the Management Committee uh, more broadly, and particularly a manager appointed by the Management Committee for the Association. So it's a similar sort of uh, definition that you see of that term in the Corporations Act, not quite as, uh, not quite as complicated perhaps. In terms of the Management Committee, uh, it's a fairly obvious definition, speaks for itself really, but the Management Committee is just those people who have been elected to the committee. So in terms of the, the new statutory duties that will be applying to, uh, to officers of, a, uh, of an incorporated association, um, we've got the uh, obligations of officers to exercise their powers and discharge their duties with care and diligence to act in good faith in the best interests of the association and for a proper purpose. Two basic key common law duties. The next one is not, not to improperly use their position for gain. Um, that is pecuniary material advantage either for themselves or, and importantly, for others associated with them. And the third is to not properly, uh, improperly use their information obtained um, from their position to gain a benefit, uh, either for themselves or donors associated. In terms of management committee obligations, um, three key uh, uh, duties there, not to disclose, uh, to disclose a material personal interest, come back to that, uh, to disclose remuneration or benefits paid to management committee members and importantly to senior staff members. Miles is going to make some comments about that and their relatives. And also to prevent insolvent trading of the association. And that obligation applies not just to management committee members but also to those who have been involved with the management of the, uh, of the association itself. And perhaps this is where there's a fairly significant difference, uh, I think it's fair to say. I, I certainly had the view that all of the duties that I've just mentioned effectively replicate common law duties uh, as they've been developed in very in recent years, a number of very high profile public company um, um, uh, cases concerning directors' duties. But in the case of insolvent trading, there's been a uh, fair degree of uncertainty, I suppose it's fair to say, around incorporated associations because those obligations are statutorily provided for in the Corporations Act. They're not a common law uh, obligation as such. And so whether or not the members of a management committee of an association who have been uh, bound by obligations involved in insolvent trading has been uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat unclear. Uh, but the purpose of this change is to, uh, yeah, is, is to make that quite certain. The provisions impose uh, offence um, um, provisions or breach of these duties uh, fairly onerous, uh, up to $8,000 uh, as, uh, as the penalty units stand at the present time. Uh, some criticism about that level of 
uh, offence in the uh, material that was um, presented to the parliamentary committee. Um, but the parliamentary committee observed in its response that in actual fact the level of, of penalties were fairly comparable to other Australian states. So, uh, so that's where we stand. But in terms of some general comments around duties and, and what, it, what it's likely to mean for associations, the first thing I, I would pick up on is um, the distinction between, uh, between associations and um, companies limited by guarantee, and in particular to companies limited by guarantee which are registered as charities. So um, for for a CLG registered with the ACNC, uh, you may be aware that the uh, that a number of the statutory provisions in the Corporations Act have effectively been turned off so far as they apply to registered charities. And the duties of directors is one of those areas which has been turned off. And the purpose of that is to, if you like, leave the area of statutory duties as it applies to the directors of charitable companies that are by guarantee, just to the corporate governance, the governance standards uh, under the ACNC Act, and in particular, Governance Standard 5, which imposes certain obligations. But importantly, Governance Standard 5 imposes those obligations on the charity itself. They oblige the charity to do their best <clears throat> take their best, use their best endeavours, as it were, to ensure that the directors of a registered charity carry out those obligations. They're not personal obligations, if you like, on the, uh, on the directors uh, of the charity themselves. Um, unlike the position, as it will be, for those incorporated associations who are registered with the ACNC as a registered charity, because um, for those organisations, they'll have the obligations under the government standards on the organisation itself, but also um, uh, in the, the personal obligations uh, on the directors. Does that matter? Well, <coughs> I think it does. Uh, the the defend, their are defences uh, uh, differ between uh, the three different regimes. Um, I think the um, that's particularly so. I think. Uh, in relation to the insolvent trading provisions. Um, and I, I think that we're likely to see more, not less, uh, regulatory arbitrage, as it, uh, as it were, between the use of the incorporated association structure um, and companies limited by guarantee, particularly um, for charities. I mean, I've, I've certainly been saying for, for, for quite a number of years that, uh, that I prefer charity structures, uh, CLGs, as opposed to incorporate associations for a number of reasons. And I think this is probably another reason for that. Another aspect too, I think, is the fact that we, 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 we are complicating the Associations and Corporations Act. Mile uh, averted to the extent, the extent of change that we're going to see, the whole raison d'etre of the Act was to impose it a reasonably benign sort of regulatory regime for smaller NGOs, if you like. And I think that where we're getting to is uh, quite some detail. Um, um, you know, the, 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 the rationale behind, behind uh, the, the benefits of an, of an incorporated association, I think, diminish. The next point I would make is uh, around the um, around the possible implications for uh, the Civil Liability Act exemption for volunteers, that is, um, um, members of an incorporated association um, involved in community work, um, because there uh, are offences now under the Act for breach of these duties, a query as to whether or not um, the, that statutory immunity for volunteers is, is compromised. There was a point that the Law Society made in the, uh, to the Parliamentary Committee, but that was not dealt with at all in the, uh, in the report. So 
It's, uh, that, I think, is something uh, to bear in mind. Um, I think around the, um, the area dealing with the duty of good faith, um, I think there's a, uh, an interesting point to make there. Um, in the Corporations Act regime, <clears throat> the, uh, the obligation of a director to act in the best interests of the company is slightly compromised or, or, or um, uh, tailored, if you like, um, for the directors of a wholly owned subsidiary company because the provision says that if there's a provision in the constitution of a subsidiary that allows directors to act in the best interest of the, of the holding company, then that satisfies that obligation to the company itself. Now, there's no such provision in the, in the amendment, and there probably isn't intended to be, because that provision only applies to a wholly owned subsidiary company of the company. And, uh, and there's been a, uh, a view that uh, incorporated associations need to have at least seven members. And so that sort of wholly owned subsidiary con uh, company concept uh, probably can't exist in the incorporated association context. However, it hasn't been certain. Uh, the Act says that you need to have seven people, seven members to incorporate an association. And it also says that if you don't have seven people, then that's a ground for winding up. But it doesn't say that you must maintain at least seven members. And so uh, the, we, I would say that the, it's, a, it's a point that's been made to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Office of Fair Trading in earlier submissions. There was an opportunity of clarifying that. Unfortunately, it hasn't been taken. But nevertheless, uh, we don't have the same sort of provisions um, for, for wholly owned subsidiaries that we do in, under the Corporations Act. I mentioned insolvent trading provisions. Um, the one point that I would make is that uh, unlike the Corporations Act, there's no safe harbour defence um, for the insolvent trading provisions. And what that basically, uh, what that basically means is that uh, certainly in the corporations context, um, there is a defence in a situation where the directors um, um, have taken a course of action that's reasonably likely to lead to a better outcome for the company. Um, you know, gives quite some discretion in that uh, early administration period uh, for, um, uh, for directors of the company. No such provision, uh, as I say, in the amendments to the AIA. Um, the provisions dealing with material personal interest I mentioned before that they are imposed, that obligation is imposed on members of the management committee. Um, that's unlikely to apply in the situation where the secretary to the committee has been appointed as opposed to having been elected. In the appointed uh, scenario, that person uh, won't be a member of the, of the management committee. Um, should they be, query, uh, probably. Uh, uh, the Law Society thought that, that that obligation ought to extend not just to members, but also, uh, but, but, more, but more broadly to officers. So, uh, query that. Um, and the final thing I'd say on that point is that uh, under the provisions where there is a material personal interest that has to be tabled, it has to be minuted, and it has to be presented at the next following general meeting of members. Uh, members of the association have the ability to call for, uh, to cite the disclosure, uh, see what it means, what the implications are. Um, that imposes its own obligations on the, uh, on the committee uh, to, you know, just should there be, is there a cost involved? Should, should that be passed on? Uh, no provision for any cost to be passed on to the requisitioning member in that instance. And also it raises some issue also as to what is able to be disclosed to, uh, to a member of the association who's requested detail, a uh, member of an association, indeed a shareholder of a company, is not entitled to see uh, uh, direct, uh, minutes of directors' meetings. So, you know, the extent of that disclosure, uh, should minutes be redacted and so forth, they're the sort, there's some sort of practical 
uh, issues that might well flow um, from those statutory requirements. Miles. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I want to pick up on one of the uh, bold public uh, policy reforms uh, in this Act, and that is uh, disclosure of remuneration. So that slide should come up uh, very shortly. And this has been in the uh, public gaze, uh, mostly interstate, um, particularly with the ACNC investigating organisations uh, where there has been uh, remuneration uh, of, uh, of governance uh, people, uh, and there's, there's, they've come to grief. Um, so the Act uh, takes a lead uh, amongst incorporated association uh, regimes in Australia uh, by its gain to require that the members of the Management Committee uh, present uh, their remuneration to the annual general meeting. Now, the form of that uh, presentation uh, is to be prescribed in the legislation, uh, sorry, in the regulations, uh, but the Office of Fair Trading uh, advised the Parliamentary Committee that the intention is that the regulation will require associations to specify the total remuneration paid to all relevant committee members, staff and relatives as a single value. So it will be lumps, one lump sum. So they're not intending uh, for the uh, remuneration of the, the CEO or the general manager, as well as each individual committee member to be disclosed to the annual general meeting. It will be um, one lump sum. Uh, there is, uh, there was uh, before the parliamentary uh, committee, uh, a deal of discussion about this. Um, so who is remunerating uh, their committees in Queensland Incorporated Associations. We don't quite know, but um, from uh, my dealing and talking to other people, uh, it seemed to start in the late 90s, um, and there were some disability organisations, there were some schools, and there were some Indigenous uh, organisations that paid their members uh, sitting fees. Uh, this is growing um, during... Uh, the 2000s, as it has with Companies Limited by Guarantee, where uh, uh, charitable and other undertakings have become more sophisticated, and particularly in licensed clubs and some of the biggest organisations on the incorporated association uh, register in Queensland appear to be uh, licensed clubs. In New South Wales, uh, licensed uh, clubs uh, have to be uh, companies limited by guarantee. Uh, but in Queensland, that's not the situation. So uh, we've, had, uh, we've had substantial enterprise uh, entering the incorporated associations uh, field. And I can't help feeling that we're now, um, the, the government's regulating for the, for, the, for the top end rather than the uh, base community organisations, which it was supposed to uh, be designed for. Anyway, as Paul alluded, we may have some move out of the jurisdiction because uh, the government a number of years ago made it relatively easy for incorporated associations to migrate to companies limited by guarantee. So I see there's a question about um, who's going to have to disclose. Uh, well, the uh, proposed bill uh, says that remunerations or benefits um, and I know I used to chuckle early in my days when uh, clubs couldn't get um, committee members, um, they would allow a committee member to have a free bar tab and they, they soon filled up their committee. Whether it was the right people is, a, is another question, but that would be a benefit. So remuneration or benefits paid to a management committee member, note that a, um, an appointed secretary will not satisfy um, that definition. It goes further than that, it goes to senior staff. Well, who, how do you decide senior staff? The Act sets out a, a test which says uh, a, a staff member who makes decisions affecting at least a substantial part or activities of the association. Now, I think hopefully there'll be a bit of common sense here. And I would say that that would uh, apply to the CEO, general manager um, who is employed, who has substantial um, control, hire and fire 
uh, delegations uh, from the management committee or has the capacity to do so uh, in the act as well. That's a sort of a, a gloss on it. It even goes further than that and it will include uh, benefits to relatives of either management committee members or senior staff. Um, so this is likely to catch uh, people who are employed uh, who would otherwise receive some benefits. So I guess this is uh, trying to stop a backdoor way of saying, well, don't pay me, but uh, sling a bit to my, uh, to my wife or my kids. So the definition of relative um, was clarified uh, in the parliamentary committee report and by the OFT and will include spouse, parent, sibling, child, grandparent or grandchild. Um, and I would, uh, uh, as a matter of best practice, caution uh, incorporated associations where there is any, any uh, familiarity or, or tie uh, and somebody's receiving a benefit that is probably uh, the best to disclose it, even though you may not fall within the uh, black letter of the law. Um, uh, there's a question, what if the CEO is also a member of the board? Does their salary need to be disclosed? Well, yes, it will be. Now, you know, there's a bit of um, unease, I think, particularly uh, amongst some of the larger uh, incorporated associations about disclosure of uh, CEO salaries. Um, that's often private in, regarded as private information. Uh, whether people will be able to dissect what their salary is from looking at the, the lumping arrangements is uh, yet to be seen. Um, I guess that's, that's, a, that's a worry. Um, in the private sector with listed companies, when they, when they allowed, well, sorry, when they mandated this sort of disclosure and transparency, um, CEO pay increased. Um, so it ratcheted up rather than down whether we'll see that same effect that uh, CEOs uh, know what other people are getting now and can use that to get pay rises or, or associations feel that they've got to meet the market, um, that's yet to be seen. Uh, another possible um, side effect may be there may be league table, tables of, uh, league tables developed of who's paying uh, what for various, uh, various boards. Um, and I think it'll be, uh, be an interesting time uh, for the first AGM after this uh, bill is, becomes law and uh, the members maybe for the first time uh, realise uh, what is being paid. It's probably quite within their rights to, uh, to pass resolutions to, um, to see what individual members of the management committee or staff are, are receiving. Um, so, if in a in a fractious association, this may be another uh, grist to um, encouraging internal disputes. But uh, we'll see. I guess things will probably settle down after the uh, the first uh, disclosure, and perhaps there might be a bit of uh, entrepreneurial um, parts of the press gallery also make a story out of it. So the the associations and companies and by guarantee that are paying their boards uh, particularly large boards with significant responsibilities um, i think best practice is to seek uh, the board to seek an independent assessment of uh, the remuneration levels uh, from an independent uh, party and there are a number of uh, uh, organizations um, for-profit organizations uh, that um, do keep uh, surveys and records of uh, what, what, what board members are getting paid for what work and level of complexity, um, quite sophisticated uh, in fact, but uh, you have to pay uh, for that. But it does provide an independent uh, benchmark uh, so that uh, if, if you're called to account, you can say, well, we've got an independent, um, uh, independent and competent uh, person uh, who's skilled in the area uh, to make this judgment and, and here's the report and uh, we've stayed within those uh, guidelines. Um, so uh, that's going to be uh, an interesting, um, interesting development. Uh, if the bill uh, does lapse and it has to be re-ended, it'll be interesting to see whether the big end of uh, the association uh, town uh, brings its substantial lobbying weight uh, to bear 
uh, to alter this uh, provision. Uh, so Paul, over to you with more on internal disputes, um, looking at grievance procedures. Okay, thank you, Mark. So uh, the grievance procedure provisions are probably an example of, um, I guess, regulation, um, I, I would say, endeavouring to uh, fit all circumstances. And um, uh, it's a, an area of reform in the bill that um, caught some excited um, uh, commentary in the presentation and the response of the parliamentary committee. Um, it's an area too where I think there's some further uh, 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 distinguishing feet, uh, a further distinguishing feature able to be made um, with the Corporations Act in that um, there are no specific grievance procedures uh, in the Corporations Act. So the change proposed um, uh, is to is to mandate uh, a a grievance um, procedure, and importantly, there's no opt out provision uh, available. And uh, for those organisations that either don't have any grievance procedure, or if they do, um, um, not con that's not consistent with the uh, grievance procedure policies that are set out in the new provision, uh, then they're going to have to change, or alternatively, the provisions of the model rules um, will apply. And uh, it will be a while uh, before we see model, a model, uh, model rule uh, provisions around this area. It is one of those uh, areas that the uh, department representatives at the parliamentary uh, hearing said would take uh, um, some time to develop and a uh, time period of some two years was, uh, was mentioned as the appropriate time to develop appropriate grievance procedures in the model rules um, uh, which people could develop. And um, you know, I, I was quite interested in the, in the commentary uh, made um, by the department really about how that would be sufficient time for people to deal with current disputes or essentially to get their own house in order. The principles, um, oh, before I mention that, uh, as I've said on the screen there, um, one of the important uh, amendments um, that these changes make to the existing Act are uh, that uh, there's no right to, uh, for either the association or, or an aggrieved member to uh, pop off to the Supreme Court uh, to seek redress as currently applies um, under the Associations and Corporations Act. In other words, grievance procedure is a prerequisite um, or a procedure, having gone through the procedure is a prerequisite uh, for proceedings to be instituted. Uh, in terms of the principles around uh, the grievance procedures uh, in the Act, perhaps one could say that they, uh, that they reflect best practice. I'm not so sure about that. I get a bit wary when I hear people talking about best practice. It's one of those terms that's bandied around. I think few people really understand what it means um, most of the time. Uh, whether it's applicable or not too is, a, is an important thing to understand. I'll come back to that. But uh, those principles in the amendment uh, are said to be um, that the procedure firstly must involve uh, mediation as a prerequisite. Um, I'll say a bit more about that in a tick. Um, the mediator, when appointed, has to be unbiased, a statement of uh, natural justice principle. Uh, a member may, may appoint any person to act on their behalf in, uh, in the grievance procedure of an organisation. That person doesn't have to be a member. It can be anybody. It can be a legally qualified person, I dare say. Each party has to be given an opportunity to be heard in a dispute. Nothing uh, contentious about that. It's, again, another statement of uh, a basic uh, natural justice precept. And uh, finally, uh, the principle that an association must not take disciplinary action against a member um, uh, where the member has um, uh, instituted the uh, grievance procedure. Uh, in other words, the grievance procedure has to have run its course uh, before uh, any disciplinary action um, is able to be taken. Now, I mentioned uh, um, uh, a moment ago um, made reference to mediation. What does it mean? There's no definition for mediation. Um, 
it has its normal um, uh, uh, meaning, uh, whatever that is, uh, an interpretation of that term uh, from the Lexus Australian Legal Dic Dictionary is that mediation is a method of dispute, uh, dispute resolution in which an impartial third party seeks to facilitate a settlement by encouraging the disputing parties to generate solutions that focus on their mutual interests. And therein, I think, lies the main problem to the proposed change, um, that of the need for mediation, because mediation won't always be applicable. Um, one of the submissions made to the, to the uh, Parliamentary Committee um, was around the fact that many incorporated associations hold liquor licences. Um, many of our large licensed clubs um, are, um, are incorporated associations. There are, are obligations under the Liquor Act for the licensee to maintain certain standard of conduct, to take action uh, in the event of disruption, um, uh, disturbance, uh, aggressive behaviour and so forth. Um, should a mediation procedure be gone through when a, when a licensed club wants to terminate um, uh, the membership of um, a member who's uh, flouted the rules and caused distress or, or disharmony or, 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 or indeed a dangerous situation in a, in a club precinct? Um, other situations that call to mind frequently are the need for um, workplace health and safety uh, requirements for immediate action to be taken. Uh, one can imagine the, the situation, for example, of a, um, of a child care centre uh, structure as an incorporated association, um, a member of the management committee uh, loses his or her blue card, um, the need to be able to take action. Is mediation appropriate? Almost certainly not. So there's another case, and and uh, and there are other such instances. I think um, it's quite common for a lot of the larger service clubs to be bound by international rules or or or, uh, or at least national rules uh, dealing with the range of things, including um, disciplinary action, um, their own grievance procedures. How will these provisions work? How will the model rules work uh, um, with, the, with, with those, those sorts of arrangements? A lot of the churches have their uh, have canon law or, or, um, or their own provisions around, uh, around their own governance, their own rules. Um, um, again, how will they work? So I think, I think we're, it will be interesting to see how the model rule develops. Uh, because unfortunately there isn't the latitude, there isn't the ability for uh, administrative exclusion or qualification in the, uh, in the administration of, of this particular um, provision um, in, in the bill. Um, and I think that's probably all I need to say on, on that, Miles. Thanks, Paul. We'll move to the uh, next slide where we've identified just some of the other provisions. There, there are more, but we've just identified these. We think they're important uh, for you to know about. Firstly, um, you no longer required to have a seal. Now, not the sort that you find at SeaWorld, uh, but this is a rubber stamp often with the name of the association on it and it's affixed to very important legal documents such as transfers or security, securitization documents. Um, and it's usually affixed over the signatures of of two of the management committee uh, officers. Um, that'll no longer be required. Um, many associations never bothered getting one anyway. Um, uh, and when I actually went to get one, um, I thought I was charged an arm and a leg uh, to buy it. It was just a, just a, just a seal, but anyway, um, quite expensive. Um, so they're no longer going to be required. Um, but I would check your rules. Um, if your rules still require them, um, then you've, you've got this conflict set up between the Act and the rules. Um, so that may require a constitutional change to be on the right side of the law if you don't want a corporate uh, seal to execute important legal documents. It will be executed uh, by resolution 
of the management committee authorizing a, an official or, or two to to sign the uh, the document. So that's that's one uh, I think streamlining of the act. Um, second one is it's just a bit ironic in the situation that we find ourselves now. Um, uh, it will be an, a change to, for the act to permit taking part in meetings usually using technology. Uh, many rules uh, do provide for it now, but it will be formally provided in the act to put it beyond uh, beyond doubt. Uh, there will be new winding up provisions, and this has been uh, something that people have been advocating uh, for uh, in a um, uh, for a long time, and that's voluntary administration. That the this is available uh, in the company law regime. Uh, and now it will be available uh, for incorporated associations for the committee, management committee, to ask a, uh, a qualified person to come in uh, to administer the affairs of the association. Uh, it will follow the corporation's uh, law uh, procedures uh, in the main, um, and, and that's a welcome uh, provision. And, um, you know, uh, it's it's difficult if you don't have that provision and it's really unfortunate that the act wasn't uh dealt with uh, prior to this who would have known but i think we may be uh may be due for a few um associations to find themselves in difficulties in these these extraordinary times um the next uh point i'm going to uh ask paul to speak on um uh, because it involved a recent supreme court case uh that we picked up so over to you paul Thank you, Miles. So, yes, uh, some streamlining or <coughs> cancellation of incorporated associations will be made uh, will be made simpler. Um, it will require um, um, as similar to to the deregistration of companies under the corporations regime, but uh, a clean, limited balance sheet, uh, no debt, the ability to cancel, and and the significance of that, I think, is. is was shown up in a fairly recent uh, Supreme Court case in Queensland uh, that we recently had to consider um, in a, a situation where the um, where there had been merger um, and where the, um, the the provisions of the winding up uh, provision in the uh, in the con in the constitution of the company that, was, that had transferred its assets out. Um, hadn't been followed to the letter and uh, the, the parties concerned had in fact endeavoured to uh, cancel the, uh, the company's registration with the Office of Fair Trading. Um, I was able to do that, but uh, hadn't complied with the uh, requisite provisions um, in the constitution. So I think, I think that in the case of merger where this sort of, this situation will often apply, the assets will be transferred over, there'll be a, a winding up. I think that uh, I think that with uh, appropriate uh, drafting amendment to the uh, to the provisions of the Constitution of the Incorporated Associ Association, that process will be streamlined and made a lot simpler than it currently is. So it's a, it's a good reform. Thanks, Paul. Um, just two, two points before we'll take some questions. Um, first is that uh, the OFT investigations get some uh, new powers for search and seizure, so um, beware. Of course, they are constrained by the uh, the usual protections um, of those uh, freedoms, but uh, uh, they will get some um, new investigative pow powers. And um, given that the uh, ones that they have at the moment are, are really quite out of date, uh, it's good to see that they're modernised and hopefully they won't have to be used too often. Um, there are some minor amendments to the Collections Act as well. These are to deal with disaster appeals and Goodness, aren't we in a disaster at the moment? But uh, the 2009 uh, Weller report uh, gave some suggestions for streamlining all sorts of appointments and tribunals uh, to, uh, for the government. And one of them was uh, the governor and council had to appoint uh, a committee to oversee a disaster appeal account. Um, and that, that's been given uh, basically to the OFT and uh, the chief executive will be chair of that committee. So where you have, you know, disaster appeals that sort of arise up for a house fire or a bus crash for people and they get out of hand, uh, uh, the government can step in through the public trustee and others 
to regularize it and uh, make sure that distributions occur. Unfortunately, the rest of the Collections Act still remains for reform. And it's my dying wish, well, I hope it's not my dying wish, but it's a wish before I die that we see the Collections Act, which is well overdue for reform. Uh, reform. Um, it just doesn't take account of the uh, digital fundraising regime that we have. And, you know, it's just a ticking time bomb for a disaster. So there needs to be some uh, really smart public policy thinking going into how we, uh, how we reform the Collections Act in Queensland. And it would be really good if we could harmonise it for the rest of Australia, because it really is a really cost impact for charities that want to do the right thing and comply by the law, have to do it in each state and territory of Australia. So um, after that uh, bit of a soapbox, uh, Paul, I think uh, we're open for questions. And uh, I see we have some in the uh, Q&A um, uh, box. So I've opened those up. Paul, I'll uh, start with you. Uh, Paul, read the minutes. I've heard that some directors of companies suggest that since the Royal Commission into Banking, that any minutes are a future copy of a letter to a judge. Would this be similar to changes that we are talking about for the minutes for associations under this bill? Thanks, Julie and me. Yes, but, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting comment and uh, potentially that's the case. And, um, uh, minutes uh, minutes of, um, of board meetings, generally speaking, are a discoverable document uh, in the event of litigation, but they can also be subject to privilege. And so, uh, so, so it's, it's not, quite as straightforward as, uh, as that um, question might suggest. But um, the importance is that um, um, again, and there might well be an instance where uh, a particular matter is dealt with in, in a meeting which is a privileged uh, uh, communication uh, because of some issue that the association has. Well, that's to me is the, 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 a good example as to why the secretary would need to be careful about what is disclosed to uh, to a requisitioning member. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, the, the thing the thing to bear in mind is that always bear in mind that minutes, generally speaking, are discoverable in the event of litigation, and that's the important thing. Yes, we have another question, Paul. If the CEO is the only one being paid, disclosure becomes a privacy issue. Well. Uh, yes, um, it, it will, and uh, it will be interesting to see how people uh, deal with that. The uh, the other question is: Is there any charity size that applies, or it is all charities? All charities registered with the ACN, the ACNC, I would think, uh, will be subject to the streamlining uh, through the Incorporated Associations Act. We have another one here, Paul. Service clubs cannot be registered with the ACNC need to register under the Charities Act to fundraise, are they, and are a corporate association, will they report to the ACNC? Well, no, they, unless the service club is a charity, and there are some, I think, Paul, um, they won't, they won't uh, report to the ACNC. Right. Um, and, and so presumably, if they're not a charity, they'll still be reporting uh, as an incorporated associations on the OFT register. And uh, and on the collections register, you'd agree with that, Paul? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, we have another question here, Paul. If remuneration declaration change, changes apply to small charities, if you had one person required to disclose remuneration, would they have to? Yes, I think it's similar to previous point, and um, you know, on the face of what we've got now, yes, but um, this will be subject to regulation, and the bill will probably have to be reintroduced to Parliament if, um, if it doesn't meet and pass the bill between now and the election. So perhaps that's a, a, an advocacy uh, issue that you can take up. Uh, see, there's another question. Amendments, uh, will these amendments take effect from the 1st of July, 2020? Uh, well, um, no, the amendments have not yet passed Parliament. And until they do, um, they, can't, they can't apply and in any case once the Act is passed, the OFT has indicated, and the government has indicated, that there'll be a substantial consultation and education phase uh, with you know, draft model rules and um, procedures that'll go in a large consultation uh, to, the, to the sector. Um, next one, uh, I asked because I assume group reporting is to protect privacy, but would one person disclosing be a breach of privacy? 
Um, Paul, do you have anything to add to that? No, I don't. Not really, Miles. I, I, I agree with that. Yeah, so I think this is going to be um, this is going to be a, a contentious uh, issue, uh, and it looks like um, you may well be, get a chance to um, uh, talk to uh, to the government and your elected representatives um, uh, about this, and uh, perhaps there's sort of some research to be done on uh, how many associations that this could affect uh, in the uh, in the sector. Um, it being, um, uh, if the CEO is not on the board, do they still have to disclose their salary? Yes. If they are, if they are a senior employee uh, who can influence the um, activities of the association. So I would suspect somebody who, who is a CEO uh, would be able to do that. Uh, Paul, given that it's uh, 6.31 by uh, my clock, um, it's unless there are any questions, it's time to say goodbye. Um, we have a couple of slides. Um, we'd like you to participate in a poll uh, to give us some uh, feedback um, on uh, how you found the seminar. Um, at ACPNS, uh, we uh, we thank you uh, for uh, <clears throat> for this, and there will be a recording. Um, so if we could ha just have the uh, poll appear. Um, I'm going to launch the polling now. If you'd like just to respond, uh, we'd be most grateful uh, for your response to give some feedback on how, <clears throat> how you found uh, this seminar. Thank you very much uh, for, uh, for participating uh, this evening. Uh, and we, uh, we extend, Paul and I extend our best wishes uh, in these uh, most uncertain times. Uh, and uh, if either of us uh, can assist, uh, or if you have uh, further questions, um, you know where we uh, where, where we live. Um, uh, you know our email, I guess. Um, so we'd be most happy to correspond with you. But uh, please all uh, keep safe um, and uh, and take heart uh, through these uh, through these difficult times. And we hope to all see you um, uh, hail and hearty uh, in future seminars. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Uh, take care, and uh, we'll see you in the future. And if you'd like to uh, cast uh, a poll, um, we would be most grateful. Uh, we will be uh, ending this seminar uh, in in uh, in about 30 seconds' time. So, uh, Paul, over to you for a goodbye. Thank you, and goodbye, everybody. And I endorse Smiles' comments about the times. Keep safe.